Um, okay, so hello everybody. My name is Tim, like it says there, and here for that matter. Um, I work for SUSE. Um, I don't spend most of my time working on high availability or more recently um, cloud software. And some of the time this involves uh, actually developing software and being the upstream for things, and other times it involves um, uh, taking software from upstream and packaging it ourselves to run on um, Slayers or OpenSUSE or what have you. Um, so, um, what is the open build service? Um, it's a, well, as it says on the website actually, it's a generic system to build and distribute packages from sources in an automatic, consistent and reproducible way. Um, there's more information about it at openbuildservice.org and there's a reference server at build.opensuse.org which is a running instance of this thing that anybody can go and use. Um, it's, uh, the open, it was originally called the OpenSUSE build service. Um, it was first announced in about 2006 or so. A little bit of history of uh, SUSE Linux. Uh, it was originally only developed by employees of SUSE and it was uh, either difficult or impossible for outside people to, uh, to, to, con to contribute to the distro. So at some point when the OpenSUSE project was created, um, the, the build team from SUSE put together the OpenSUSE build service, uh, which is what we use to build the entire distro. It doesn't just build RPM packages, but it can make ISOs, it can make um, uh, bootable appliance images and other things like that too. Um, and uh, so we, we use it obviously to build OpenSUSE. We have our own internal instance of it uh, running inside our firewall, which is what um, the enterprise distros are built on because for various reasons you can't necessarily let that stuff out of the building until after the release date or what have you. Um, but more recently, it was renamed from OpenSUSE build service to open build service to make a point that it's just it's not just for building packages for SUSE. Um, you can use it to build packages for many distributions. Um, so why is this interesting? Why is building packages actually interesting? Uh, Arjen Lentz had a, had a good line uh, a couple of years ago, which is that a tarball is not a product. Um, if, I, I know uh, Bidale was saying the other day that you kind of want your users to be able to become developers. Um, and that's really cool, but in the, at the back at the dawn of time, um, your users probably were all developers actually because you gave, well, or at least they knew how to compile software. Um, you gave them a tarball and they did something with it and eventually they got a package. But um, if, you're, if you're anything like me, you uh, develop some software and you make it available on, on one or two distros, maybe probably the one that you're actually using yourself, using whatever tools are available, and, and if you're working on a particularly um, popular piece of software that all of the major distros have picked up anyway, maybe you don't have this problem because somebody else has solved packaging for you. Um, but uh, if somebody else hasn't solved that problem for you, and like if I want to if I want to build some software for the distro I'm using on the architecture I'm on, that version of that distro, that's fine, I can do that. But if I want to provide packages for somebody for another version or another architecture, um, I need another build machine or at least some VMs. And the number of distributions and versions and architectures, the, th this gets huge and um, you don't want to have to deal with this individually because it's a complete pain. So. Last time I gave a talk about this, I had a demo at the end. This time I'm going to do it at the start um, because I think that would be more fun. <sighs> so, um, I have here, can everybody see that? Probably not. Um, I have here a very small program. Um, um, it, it's a C program and it prints out some text. That's it. Everybody happy that there's no security exploits in this? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. 
you're not going to want to install what I produce later. <laughs> um, okay, so I should probably show you the make file. Um, it just runs GCC. I have this make archive thing which tells Mercurial to make a tarball for me. Um, and, um, and that's about it. So I will make archive. I have my tarball there. Now, um, if I go to um, build.openscissor.org, I have an account here, and I can log in. Um, anybody can get an account on this um, for, for free, um, gratis. Um, the, uh, and, and anybody can use it to... Do I have internet? Please tell me about it. Yes, I have internet. Um, anybody can get an account on this thing and go and use it to build packages. Um, there's at least one caveat, which is the software that you build using this public instance of the open build server has to be free and open source software, um, which is you know, kind of fair enough. Um, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, and so if I go to, I'll probably do it up here somewhere. Um, Software split up on this thing into a whole lot of projects, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but for now, um, suffice it to say that every user has a home project um, in, within which they can do whatever they want. So I can go in here and create a package, and it's called LCA 2013. Demo package. Um, I'm too lazy to write a description. And in just a few seconds, I have a package which is not building anything because I haven't given it any source files to deal with yet. So I will go and upload my table. And now it's still not doing anything because I haven't actually told it how to build. So the other thing I need to give it um, to build RPM packages is a spec file. Uh, you can't get around that. Um, you, you need some definition of actually how to create a package and for RPM distros it's spec files. So I will go and upload the spec file too. And I'll just show you that just for fun, just so that you know that I'm not putting anything um, terribly bad in here. Um, package name, version, description. Um, I wasn't too lazy to write a description there. Um, it's not a very good description, but um, it'll, uh, it'll do the job. Um, yeah, and it's just make and a list of files. Um, and uh, and there you go. So back back. Can I get those build results chopped up? Okay. Um, so here it's showing me that I've. It's showing me that it's building for a bunch of um, uh, different distributions, and you can actually go and look at the look at the build log while it's running too to see what it's doing. Um, and um, well, it only took thirty seconds because it's not a terribly big package. But um, now, now that I've done that and I've got some builds. Um, any of you who are feeling really brave can go here to build.openscissor.org to my home project and can click this download package button. Um, at least if you've got CentOS or Slaves because it obviously hasn't finished building the other ones yet. Um, so you can go here and get that package and, and I'm done. My package is now available to the world for at least a couple of distros. Um, so I might jump back here again. Apparently nothing went wrong, so that was good. Don't download it yet. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, do I have a do I have a build for OpenSUSE yet? Guess not. Um, uh, almost, it's still building. Um, I'll, I'll, get, I'll get that later. <coughs> um, so, what's all going on underneath here? Um, um, there's the OBS server itself, um, which looks after users. Um, it's got a database of things. You can search through it for packages. Um, there's a whole lot of storage, there's a whole lot of build hosts. So when you actually kick off a build of something, it will go and spin up a VM instance somewhere, um, install all of the necessary dependencies to build your package, and then it will build your package in there. And this is, this is how it meets those, um, uh, the, the consistency and reliability um, thing that I talked about before. Um, because the, the build environment is always completely clean. If you're building something on your, your desktop system, you might have extra stuff in there that you've forgotten to add to your list of dependencies of your package or whatever. Um, uh, because you get a clean build environment every time, you know that um, uh, you've got those reliable, consistent builds. Um, the, the mirror interface over there is how um, packages make it from the storage to the rest of the universe. They end up in um, uh, RPMMD repository so you can use them with um, YUM or uh, YAST or Zipper or whatever. Um, I'll get to Debian in a second. Um, there's a notification server you can subscribe to, notifications when builds fail or succeed um, if you really want to receive a lot of email. Um, I, I suggest not subscribing to the success ones, just subscribe to the failure ones because they're the ones you have to fix. Um, the server itself uh, has a REST API, so there's a bunch of ways that you can talk to it. And what I was doing before was using the, the web interface to obviously talk to the back end. Um, there's also a command line client called OSC, um, which is available for, you can, incredibly, this is built using the open build service, so in the Devel tools repository, you can go and get the OSC command line client um, for many and varied distros, and then you can um, use that from the shell and you can do interesting things there because all of the the source for all the packages the tarballs and the spec files and everything is actually in revision control on this thing um, so you can go back and see the changes that you've made to your packaging of something over time and you can do diffs from one to the other and, and all that sort of thing um, so uh, at the moment apparently we have there's about 32,000 confirmed users on this system of um, 51,000 package builds per day. Uh, I, personally, it seems to be more uh, heavily loaded when Europe is awake, um, which means that's okay for me because my builds schedule immediately during the day in Australia. Um, and in terms of distros supported, um, all of these ones. Um, uh, a couple of Susie's, um, a couple of Red Hatty things, um, a couple of Debian -y things. Arch Linux is a recent one that got um, added sometime, um, oh, sometime in the last year, probably I think. Um, so I've I've just gone and built a an RPM by by uploading a tarball and running a spec file. If I want to package that for Debian as well, I will go back to my web browser, which I'm being confused by. Sorry. Um, if I want to build it for Debian as well, I have to give it a few more things, um, which I prepared earlier to save me writing them now and screwing up the format of the changelog file, which will... If anybody's ever screwed up out of a Debian changelog file and tried to figure out what you've done wrong. Um, uh, but maybe that's just me. I don't do a lot of Debian packaging, actually. Um, so, Debian changelog. Uh, there's nothing in the changelog that just says initial packaging by me. Control. Um, the, the, th the, other, the other interesting thing here is that the, um, these files that I'm adding, the, the changelog and the control file and the 
um, what's the, the rules file and the DSC um, are, are the minimum set of files that you need to build a Debian package. Uh, and OBS will do the right thing with them to make the, the build work. Um, uh, I've approached this from the perspective of somebody who's used to packaging RPMs and had already written a spec file. So I've just gone and written these extra um, Debian files as well. But if you were starting with um, uh, an actual Debian package made with um, dpackage, create package or whatever the command is, um, if you were starting with that, you could actually upload that to OBS and with all of those Debian required pieces that have been generated for you by the, the Debian package helpers are there, it will use those so you don't need to, um, to do this stuff. You would then just go and write a spec file to get your Debian thing to build on um, an RPM based distro. Um, if you've got a Debian package as as produced by D, D package, is a create package or something else? Package package source. D package source. D package source. Um, if you've got the thing that comes out of that um, uh, with the, the Debian subdirectory in the right place and the right files in there, then it will um, do the right thing with that. And let's see what's going on here. Okay, so uh, allegedly I've got a build going for Debian 6. Um, this excluded thing here, see that little icon um, with uh, the, the little what's it there? Um, when I upload a new file, um, it figures out whether or not it needs to um, uh, recalculate any dependencies or figure out if new builds need to happen. Um, and so there can be a little bit of lag there while it's figuring its stuff out. But um, uh, oops. Okay, and we put to have a Debian package and I've got an open Caesar package as well. So I can try that download now. No, I can't. lying to me. I didn't pray to the demo gods this morning. Okay, I'll come back and try and do that again later. Um, sorry. There we go. Okay, so that's distros. Um, project model. I mentioned before everything's in a project. You've got your home project. Um, and there's other projects. Um, a project contains a set of packages and defines what distros those packages will build for. Um, and there's other settings you can do in there as well. If you've got um, dependent dependencies that have different uh, different names on different distros, you'll find that um, uh, you know uh, Susie uses lib foo devel and foo devel libs or, or whatever way around this is. Um, you can set up in the project configuration, um, uh, you know, if this is on Fedora, substitute this package name in the spec file with this one. So you can, um, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on how complicated your spec files are, um, you can do away with having to have a whole lot of, you know, if Fedora, if whatever in your spec files by setting it up at a project level. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is, this is meant to represent that the the project can build against these two distros and it's got these packages in it. Um, the, the other thing is that projects stack, so they build in terms of each other. Um, like my, my home project um, is building things for OpenSUSE in terms of the OpenSUSE 11.1 .1 project. So that's where all the dependencies for my project come from, through that stacking. Um, uh, but there's no, there's no reason that, you, like these, these graphs could be longer, for instance. Um, if somebody's got a newer version of, say, KDE or whatever in the build service, and my software builds against KDE, I can change my project to not build against the base distro KDE, but I can make it build against that other project and get whatever newer thing that I need. Um, okay, so. And this is where I'm about to get into another demo. Um, because all of the uh, all the packages are under revision control and there's multiple users and multiple projects, 
This means that somebody else can come along and they can branch a package from my project and then they can fix things that I've screwed up because they're really nice. Um, well, we hope. And um, then they can submit those changes back to me and then I can see them and review them and I can either um, tell them very politely to go away because their, their fix was wrong um, or I can thank them profusely for um, doing my work for me. So, uh, that means it's time for another demo. If I go back now to <coughs> my web browser and I log out of, I log out as me and I log in as someone else Someone else hasn't done very much yet, um, isn't involved in any projects or anything, but I can go here and I can go and find, um, I, someone else, can go and find I, Tim's LCA 2013 demo package and I can branch that. Am I clicking through this too fast? Is this okay? Yeah, cool. Um, yes, I really want to branch it. This, this branch will then uh, end up in a, in a sub-project of, of someone else's home project called Home Someone Else Branches Home to Sarong. Um, now, if I go to my shell um, and I become someone else, Do I even know my password? Good. Okay, this is where we get to see the command line client. Um, back over here, that there, that, that project name that I'm highlighting there and the package name, um, you can run OSC, which um, gives you a whole lot of help, which you shouldn't read on this screen. It's going to take too long. Uh, I OSC check out from that project that package and I'm low down the screen there. Okay, oh, yeah, right. So this is going and talking to the OBS server using the um, the API. And this is checking out um, all of those files that you saw that I uploaded there before um, manually. Um, someone else here uh, in, in that directory has all of those files. Now, um, someone else has realized that the message that was printed out by um, uh, by my program didn't actually include the year the conference was on. So I can go and I don't, uh, how many people here are familiar with Quilt and that sort of thing? Yeah, cool. That's enough. <laughs> um, so I'm just I'm going to go and patch the source. Um, sorry about that prompt. Uh, which is Quilt new yeah, I'll add uh, 2013 and we're going to go and change the year here. Well, diff. Um, so that's the patch I've just created. Um, cool. Refresh. Okay, now I have to go and edit my spec file. Wherein I will put patch year patch and I will tell it to patch. Now I always say status because this is a revision control, there's some there's some stuff in here. Um, it's telling me that the spec file's been modified. Um, and there's a couple of unknown files, there's a series file which we don't care about. 
Um, and there's the patch file. So I will say add year.patch. And this is because I'm making changes to a package, this is a really good time to update the change log. So uh, OSC VC <coughs> will um, let me. Oh, wow. That's my other email address. Um, uh, add year. Okay. So, let's see. Status. Better add the changes file. Changes. Um, OSC diff will show me what I'm about to commit back to the, the server and OSC check in. We'll go and actually do that. In just a second. Any time now would be good. Thank you. <clears throat> so now if I go back to um, now if I go back here and reload this page, I should see uh, there's my patch, there's my changelog file. Um, back here, I, I can go and actually look at the the revision history of. Um, the, the, the commits to this um, package, but I mean that's mostly boring now because there's only one. And we can see that um, according to the status, it's um, doing various builds of things. So I'm I, someone else, um, am now happy with my changes, and I would like to. Does it link up? Sorry. Okay, I would like to submit that package back to Tim. Um, someone else is going to submit these changes back to Tim so he can go and look at them. So uh, add year to text printed out. Um, and here, actually, I, I have the option to remove this local package if the request is accepted. So if you're just, um, uh, you know, um, midnight patching, run in and out, patch gone. Yeah, and you don't want to look at this project anymore, you can do that. You can branch, patch, submit, your thing gets deleted, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Or you can keep it around for a long time if you, can, if you plan to keep working on it. Uh, but someone else doesn't plan to keep working on this, so that local package can be removed if the request is accepted. Um, The internet's always slower when you use it during presentations. I don't know why. Uh, so now, if someone else logs out, and if Tim logs back in, I can go and look at a list of requests um, that have come in to me on projects that I'm involved in. Um, uh, just for entertainment, that first one there, OpenSUSE maintenance, whatever it was, was a, um, this is a request that I submitted to OpenSUSE to fix some bug. And that's, this means it's actually gone through the maintenance process. So the open build service has, um, uh, uh, somebody on the maintenance team has reviewed my thing and has accepted it into the uh, updates repository and then it's gone out into the world. Um, somebody declined my RabbitMQ request, which is fine because somebody else fixed that. And um, here, the third one there, you can see someone else has put in a submit request for my LCA 23, uh, 2013 package which I can go and look at, and it shows me the, uh, the change log, the change to the spec file. It shows me this new file that's been added. Um, if I'd actually gone and uploaded a different source tarball, it would actually pick that apart and show me the diffs between the, 
inside the source, which is really cool. Uh, but because I, Tim, trust someone else, Tim, um, I'm good with this patch. Um, and I will accept that, and then that will be uh, applied to my copy of this package, and that will build, and then everybody else can go and get this new improved uh, test program that actually prints out the right year. Um, the, this, this request, um, this submit request process, you can have more steps to this. You can have users within a project that have different permissions. Um, you can have a, uh, someone who's got full permission, someone who, um, Andrew, yeah? Um, might I miss something? Are those requests already tested? Have I gone through the build system ah. first? Because, I mean, if you get, I, I'm much more likely to accept a patch that's, yeah. um, I know at least has produced a viable package once. Um, okay, so the question was, um, uh, have those requests that come through, have they already been built so that you actually know that they work? Um, I accepted that quite quickly, and at that time it may or may not have been built yet. Um, but somewhere on that page, um, which is well, somewhere on the previous page where you accept the request, you can see what the build status is in the project that it came from. So you can see, you can review the patch and you can look at that and go, oh, okay, it actually did build in, in the submitter's repository as well. So actually, um, uh, you, the person reviewing the patch, it's good, it's built, done, now I will accept. Um, uh, yeah, does it, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so you can have users with different roles, um, so you can have somebody who's only a reviewer, um, who, you, if you have a larger team, who would just go, yeah, okay, I've reviewed this and it's good, but I don't want to actually accept this yet until um, the lead developer also accepts it, so you can have a bit more process to it, if, you, um, if that works um, for you and your team. Um, okay. Now, let's see if I can go back to. Oh, well. There we go. Go back here and see if I've got anything to download yet so I can. Um, oh, look, CentOS build failed. It said. Maybe the patch was dodgy. Maybe I should have waited to see if someone else had actually produced a viable build. <laughs> dodgy bugger. Um, so it seems that I do actually have a download of this um, uh, one version or another. And uh, what else is do? I never use Yes for installing software. I use command line things. Okay, that's why I never use this to install software. <laughs> um, I should mention also that um, it, th there's a uh, GPG keys generated for each project, so they automatically get signed by the project's key. So you um, you know that the the build has some integrity integrity at least out of the build system, provided you of course trust the people who are running the build system. And well, I do. Um, so. Oh, look, here we go. Um, it's telling me that it's found this, uh, this GPG key in my home project, and um, I should probably um, trust that, or it's something to let me install the software. And... How many dialogues does this thing have? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so now if I go back to my terminal, um, um, I can run that, and okay, that's the old that's the old pre-patched one. But anyway, the point is that software was built, downloaded, installed, um, and this was this was more or less completely painless. And I've got builds of this thing for um, like 
four versions of eight different distros um, without having to go to a lot of trouble. And let's see where we're up to now. Um, that's that demo. Um, so some random points about um, uh, OBS itself. It's all free and open source software. It's under the GPL. Um, OBS is on GitHub, so you can go there and um, play around with the source. Um, the it's it's um, yeah okay. So the web front end is um, uh, Ruby on Rails. The back end code is a whole lot of Perl um, and Shell and other bits and pieces. So it's it's um, uh, it's largely those languages of that um, nature. Um, and in terms of um, this this graph's a bit pale perhaps, um, but you can you can these are the commits to master. Um, from 2006 up to 2012, so we can kind of see that there's been a fair bit more work going on in the last few years than there was um, uh, initially when it all started up. Um, who's using this thing? Uh, we are, obviously. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of other people using it to um, um, various communities, um, Intel, Cray, Dell, some other people. Um, I. I'm not entirely certain what Microsoft are doing with it. Um, anyway, um, the um, uh, Dell's kind of an, an interesting case, and I'm, I'm really sorry to point this out to, to, to Dell on something that's being recorded, but I think it's a bad idea. Um, uh, Dell. Uh, this, this, um, this public repository of theirs um, of various software, there's like firmware and bits and pieces in here. Have a look at these setup instructions. Just here. Can anybody tell me what's wrong with this? It's coming from a uh, untrusted, unencrypted HTTP source. Can you find the Oh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I went and looked at this the CGI script and it. Uh, yeah, anyway. um, no, it's fine. It's not doing anything bad. Okay, it's it's completely kosher. It's just um, if it was me, I would I would have printed out the instructions to you know go here at this repository. Yeah, you know, um, it just um, sorry. I've seen this, and I I don't want to pick on Dell, I, but I've I've seen that on in a couple of places on a few websites. But here's how you get our software: you you pipe something straight off of uh, out of out of wget into Bash, and it terrifies me every time I see it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop bashing now. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm fairly nice, actually. Uh, okay. Um, so that's, oh yeah, um, other people using it. Um, VLC project apparently uses it. Um, uh, Pac-Man, but that's other stuff for um, uh, OpenSUSE mostly. Um, if you want support for it, there's um, people on the IRC channel, OpenSUSE build service on Freenode, uh, there's a mailing list. Um, you can get professional support for it from B1 Systems, um, um, I think they're in Germany. Um, and that's probably a good time to segue into other things I should mention. So, uh, before I, earlier I was creating uh, tarballs myself and I was uploading them to um, the build service. There's another way of doing this. You can make the build service pull a tarball directly from somewhere else. Um, last time I gave a talk about this, which is kind of funny because last time I was in Canberra I actually gave a talk about the open build service and I was in this same room, um, which is really kind of creepy. Um, I wonder if it'll happen again. Um, uh, so a, a story that I told um, last time I gave a talk like this um, was, if I go back to my home project again, and I go back to the packages here. Um, uh, one night a couple of years ago, um, my wife and I were at uh, a friend's place for dinner with her laptop for some reason. And somebody asked me at the time, um, is there any astrology software for Linux? And I had no idea at all. Um, if such things existed. Um, but I googled around and it turned out that there was one um, called Open Astro and whoever it was that wrote this thing um, had um, has a uh, Ubuntu PPA 
Um, and they'd made an Arch package available, but they didn't have anything that would run on um, SUSE. They only had a, um, uh, a tarball. So what you can actually do, I still had to write a spec file for this thing. Um, uh, but there's this, uh, there's this concept called service files. And if you have a look at this, um, it's a little XML file which says, go and download this thing from here. And so when the build runs, the first thing it'll do is it'll actually go and get that tarball for you. And it will run this completely on the server. So I, I actually sat here in, um, at, <coughs> at dinner in my web browser writing a spec file in the little, in the little in page editor here and a service file and then went, okay, go. Um, and the thing went away and um, pulled the table down and built it and then I was able to install it and I had a um, delightful new piece of software at the end of dinner. Um, so that's, that's one thing. But another thing about um, where, where the service files get a little bit more interesting uh, is you can use them to pull straight from GitHub. Uh, or sorry, GitHub, Jesus. GitHub has become Git in my brain. This is not a good sign. Um, okay, so if I go and look at, I'm going to randomly pull something out of an OpenStack project of some description. Um, this is another example of, um, of, of stacking projects and having sub-projects. So the idea here is, um, uh, uh, you know, OpenStack Essex packages that somebody's working on go into this staging project first. Um, and then they're only allowed to go back here once they've been through testing or the, the build works or, or whatever. So you can, um, again, there's lots of interesting things that you can do with, with workflow and, and teams to, to sort of work together um, and make sure that things end up in the right place. Um, actually, because this is all, um, uh, because OBS has APIs and everything, um, what, uh, what we did internally on our internal instance of the build service um, we've got Jenkins running somewhere to run tests of OpenStack and what if somebody set up this Jenkins job to go and um, uh, get all of the upstream source for OpenStack, um, uh, shove it into OBS, have it build, check whether the build worked, um, then go and install that on some test VM. This isn't part of OBS, this is something that uses OBS. Go and install all those packages in some test VMs, um, run integration testing, spin up an OpenStack um, setup. And once that's worked, then it would go and automatically submit those packages that were known to be tested to um, the, uh, to our, our, our stable project, if you like, which is actually a, a longer answer for um, Andrew's question before, which was um, uh, somebody wrote this extra stuff to uh, uh, using the APIs to get packages in and out and also run tests and then shove things back in. So um, you can do that because it's because there's a command line client or the API if you want to play with that. Um, you can do those sorts of things if you want to um, write some extra stuff. Uh, but um, yeah, so what I was going to randomly pick in glance. The service file here. Um, notice that terrifying table name. Uh, git dot timestamp dot oh god oh god. Okay, so here um, it's pulling from GitHub um, version git master. Probably going to, is it going to take the, no it's not, no that's okay. Um, versions and version formats, these things actually end up in the table name. Um, and you can make sure that it, that it actually checks out a specific branch or a particular um, commit actually. Um, so once you know that some upstream source is, is right, you can write a service file to only pull that particular commit out. Um, and Internally, that actually that does a git clone somewhere, and then this recompress thing um, uh, makes a tarball out of it with a file name in some format. And one of the things that's probably not in there, there's actually a thing that you can make this do, so it will rewrite the version in the spec file as well. So um, based on um, something that it got from upstream or, or, or whatever. So this means that you can almost 
once you've set it up once, if you want to track upstream changes, you, you either take head of upstream and um, hope they never check in anything really bad, um, or um, you end up only just changing the, 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 the commit IDs. And um, you can either see the tar SCM mode is disabled thing there. Um, that means this won't be running all the time, but you can, with the command line client, you can go OSC service disabled run, which means run the disabled services, and it will at that point go and uh, do that pull and compress and, and everything. But anyway, um, yeah, so that's uh, service files are a good thing. But it, it, it saves you making your own, um, uh, saves you having to make tarballs and shuttle them around yourself all the time. Um, Devel projects, I kind of um, I kind of alluded to that a bit with the stack projects thing. Um, with uh, OpenSUSE, uh, we have um, there'll be a project like uh, OpenSUSE Factory is the next release that's coming, and there's a whole lot of packages in that. And each one of those is not people don't work on it directly in that um, that main OpenSUSE project because that's the one that the ISOs and everything um, get built out of. Instead, each package has a, a develop project, which is a separate project which that package is developed in. It's kind of random about. Uh, to give an example, um, there's a repository uh, network HA clustering uh, factory, which has uh, a pacemaker and Corosync and um, the HA bits and pieces in there. And it's just those that handful of HA packages, and the maintainers of that repository are um, myself and about half a dozen other people. Um, and so what we do, if we want to get a new version of one of these things into the next OpenSUSE release, is we work on it in uh, in that project um, where we can break things if we want to. And then once we've got it to a, a, a state where we know that it's working and it's stable and everything, then we create a submit request to OpenSUSE factory and the, um, the build team or the release managers or people who have responsibility for the whole distro will then accept that request and then that goes into the next version. Um, Cross-compiling. Uh, this is kind of fun. Um, some people have been doing um, an OpenSUSE ARM port for a while. Um, and uh, I think there's a reasonable version of OpenSUSE 12.2 which will run um, ARM boards of various types. Um, but there wasn't actually any ARM hardware in the, in the, in the build farm anywhere. Um, so what's happening at the moment, I think, um, is it's spinning up a a KVM instance on um, x86, and then it's using um, uh, Quemu user something or other to run um, individual ARM binaries emulated. So it's not emulating the whole system because that would, it's not booting up a, ho a whole ARM um, architecture Linux install because that would be horribly, horribly slow. Um, most of it's native except for the individual commands that get run emulated. And it's still slower than it would be if it was cross compiling, but it also means that. Um, you don't need to change any of your source code or do any of those other weird things to cope with being cross-compiled. Um, there's, uh, there's more work going on in... Sorry? I was going to ask, um, is, the, um, is that using a 1.5 version of Quemu? Yeah, uh, um, so the question was, is that using a modified version of Quemu user mode? Um, uh, yes, it is. Um, we, not me personally, um, uh, apparently patched the hell out of it um, recently to um, fix lots of things and make it work um, um, right. Um, those, uh, those changes are, I don't know whether they've made it upstream yet or not, um, but somebody's on the hook for making sure they get upstream. So um, there's something going on there. Um, uh, interconnect, uh, you can have um, uh, different OBS instances talking to each other. Um, for instance, our internal one talks to the external one. So we can take, on our internal um, instance of OBS, we can say, um, uh, make me a copy of this package from OpenSUSE. Um, so this is how we can take um, things that have happened in OpenSUSE and pull them into our internal build service easily to use them for you know a newer version of SLES or whatever. Um, and the other thing is, um, I've been talking about the one that's on build.opensuse.org um, because you know anybody can go and use it. 
Uh, except, as I mentioned, if you um, happen to be building proprietary software or there's something that you need to keep secret or, 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 you, or you, uh, you want to use your own hardware because you're going to build something that builds everything a million times quicker than our one because you've got SSDs everywhere and um, hundreds of millions of dollars to build giant firms, whatever. Um, you can go and run it yourself. There's two ways that you can, probably more than two ways, um, you can go and uh, install the various OBS packages um, on OpenSUSE probably. Um, and there are, there's documentation about how to go and do that and dependencies and all the things you need to install. Um, I haven't tried this. Apparently it's difficult. So uh, somebody upon having realized that it's apparently difficult has gone and made this um, OBS appliance image thing using SUSE Studio. So you can go and download a um, uh, a disk image and um, I don't know if you can run it in a VM or not but if you boot off that disk image on a system that you don't want to use again because it's about to wipe out your hard disk and install uh, and, and completely image it as a, an OBS server or worker you go and get that disk image, you stick it on a system turn it on, come back a little while later and you've got a running um, uh, single, single host so you're only going to have one system doing builds but then you can go and deploy this thing on a bunch of other systems and you can make them all talk to each other and set up a build farm. Um, and uh, that's, um, that's markedly uh, more straightforward than actually trying to install and configure all of these bits and pieces. So there's, uh, there's something um, that um, people with more spare time than me can go and play with if they like. Um, the, um, I should also mention on that note, another interesting use of this is um, um, <clears throat> I actually think this is the sort of system that would be useful for, um, uh, oh, possibly as Dell have done actually, for anybody who's deploying, um, uh, if you're deploying uh, a stock Linux distro out in your environment, but you have some custom packages specific to your environment for doing, um, I don't know, science or, or whatever it is that you're actually doing yourselves, rather than um, manually doing a, you know, configure, make, whatever it is that you do. Um, you could use OBS to then just build those. I mean, you, you might not be planning to give these, the, these things away necessarily, or you might be, but um, you've got a reliable way of um, uh, uh, building packages of your, your in-house software even um, that you can go and deploy in your standard operating environment or, or whatever it is that you're doing. So might be something interesting there. Um, and let's see. I've got a bit of a feeling I'm done, actually. Um, so, um, unless you want me to try and fix that build failure from before. Um, any questions? Wow, everybody. Um, Can you uh, make it look like a repository? So, say you're ah. doing your own software in-house. Uh, yes. Like uh, can, uh, sorry, question was, can you make it look like a repository? Um, if I go, I won't go to that one. I will go to my home project. Um, yeah, sorry, that, that little download link is, um, uh, you can actually, build, you, can, you can embed that page in some other website if you want, so you can go get my software for Pick Your Distro. You know? um, but you can actually, there is, there is a real repository um, behind all of this. Um, so if I go and look at, um, Oh, let's go and look at that one. Um, uh, so here, download.opensuse.org, repositories, home, t -sarong. Um There's all of the distros that I've been building for. Um, and if I go in here, there's a, um, uh, there's a repo file which um, RPM, MD, foo. Um, and and, and you, you can point um, uh, anything that can understand that type of repository at that directory and use your, your package manager to, you know, you can add that as a repository to your system and away you go. Um, you had one? Yeah, um, the build VMs that you yeah. mentioned before, how tough are they to, like, I imagine that it would be more than just build a VM. Is, that, is there a configuration script that will go and, like, set everything up um, so that it's ready to be used by the OBS system? Um, it happens by magic. Uh, sorry, that was how are the VM set up. Um, let me let me see if I can dig out a build log. 
Um, see if I can... Okay, so... So, here we go. Um, okay, so... Yeah, it doesn't really tell you much, does it? Um, doing KVM build. <coughs> Pre-installs a whole lot of packages. Um, um, boots KVM, boots that system up. Um, uh, I actually don't know specifically how that's defined, but it, it works, it happens by magic. Um, um, oh, that's another thing, so you can, um, you can build, I probably shouldn't do this here, but um, using the, the OSC client, oh, sorry, um, I use someone else again. Actually, I, actually, this might not work because I deleted the project. No, I deleted the project. Um, you can run OSC build um, from the from your shell, and it will go and either build everything in a Chirrut environment on your system, um, which you might not want to do if your dependencies were written by crazy people that you don't trust and not try to break out of a Chirrut. Um, but you can also make it do the same thing that OBS does and spin up a KVM instance and. Um, do the build locally on your machine there. So um, that, and actually, I would tend to recommend that um, uh, you do just do the builds on your own machine before checking them in, because otherwise you'll get a build failure like I did before, where I obviously screwed up that patch somehow. Um, and um, if you, and it also, if you keep using the same, if you keep reusing the same build route on your on your system, it'll cache all the packages in there. So. Um, uh, you know, the first time you do it, it will download um, a couple hundred megabytes of, of RPMs to, um, to to populate the build route. But the next time you do it, it's only going to download things that have changed. Um, uh, which is another point. Um, also, when you're when OBS is building things, if any of the dependencies change, your stuff will get rebuilt automatically um, to to run to match. So, uh, yes. Uh, what about testing? Like, um, you can build a package and not guaranteed that it'll work, you might run into problems in runtime, like with things that you haven't foreseen. Yeah. Um, so the question was, what about testing? Um, it builds fine, but it might not run. Um, OBS doesn't try to solve that problem. Um, it, um, it will do some, it, it, well, it does, it does some things, like it'll, um, uh, it runs RPM lint and some other bits and pieces to, to try to make sure that your packaging is kind of okay. Um, uh, <clears throat> um, I think I, we'd, um, let's see, yeah, um, that, that would tend to be the purview of external tools. Um, so once you've got your package, then you, um, then you can go and run test suites with that. I mean, you, well, you can, if, if, your, if your software has a, has a test suite built into it, there's no reason that that can't be part of the, of, of, of the, build, of the build cycle. Um, you can have um, uh, you, you can have that happen if you've written those tests, but that's I mean that's not necessarily the same thing as a person using it in the wild. Um, but you can integrate um, uh, tests into your build process. Um, but in insofar as you can do that in the spec file or or in your make files or whatever. Um, so um, th there's I don't think there's a, uh, an extra. Um, uh, there's only as much magic for that as you put in yourself. How's that? <laughs> yeah? Um, the hooking up with GitHub to actually, you know, to get client and make a yeah. trouble and throw that in there. Um, what I've read, you basically have to, if you want to have something like a pull request gets accepted, you have OBS automatically start spinning a new package, you have to actually authorize something on GitHub to, you know, push that to OBS. Is there any way for OBS to sort of say, you know, I want to actually monitor that GitHub source and when people accept pull requests, uh. I'll, I'll start. Um, so the question was, um, is there a way to have OBS monitor the source on GitHub to see if commits that you wanted have actually made it into the tree that you're trying to pull from? 
Um, and the answer is that I'm, I don't know. Um, if, if there's a way to do it, I'm not aware of it. So um, I'm sure the um, patch is accepted. Um, <laughs> the the, um, the, the, the plugin, um, the OSC uh, client has, has plugins for doing different things. And, and there's, there's plugins to pull from SVN and plugins to pull from Git and plugins to whatever. Okay, so the source for these things is is somewhere on the on the build service. So um, that would actually be a really interesting question to ask on the OpenSUSE build service mailing list. Um, and um, uh, I, I can think of a couple of my colleagues who would actually really love to see that implemented. Um, um, I don't know if they have time to do it themselves, but actually I might mention that myself because one of them might. Um, it would, it would, um, oh, sorry, um, how annoyed would OBS be if people were rebuilding packages all the time? Um, well, um, on the one hand, that's kind of what it's for, to keep rebuilding packages when things change. Um, uh, I don't know what degree of congestion that would cause. There are graphs and things showing how many build hosts are active and what all's running at the time um, on the, the, the build service website. Um, uh, so at some point, if enough people were doing that, it would put presumably enough load on the system that all of the, the scheduling would slow down because so many things were being built, um, at which point I hope that somebody would wheel in some more hardware. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah. Okay. And how long do they keep the, uh, the different uh, like the real versions up there? Do they, you know, is, is Versions three up there of real, or uh, they, have they each and every one of them? Um, so the question was, how long do versions of different base distros get kept up there, like real? Um, uh, the answer is I'm not sure. Um, it, it's not forever. Um, uh, even the SUSE ones aren't forever. Like um, the 10.10.4, no, 10.4, <coughs> or something got got moved to discontinued, and then later on it, it's probably actually uh, none of the open SUSE ones will vanish completely. Um, uh, they, they don't remain around forever, um, but what's on there at the moment, um, I'll see what's on there at the moment actually. Um, um, if you go into, in your project, if you go into repositories and, oh, sorry. Um, uh, repositories are set at a project level, so you can't. Uh, you can change what individual packages build for at the package level, but you can only add, add more repositories at the um, uh, at the project level. So by default, right now, um, we've got uh, OpenSUSE 11.4 and newer, uh, SLES 10 and newer, Debian 6. This is interesting. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, Debian 5 was listed there, and I've still got builds running against Debian 5, um, but it's not listed here as one that you can add now, at least on that default page, which maybe that means it's going to disappear, I'm not sure. Um, uh, Fedora 16 through 18, RHEL 4, 5, 6, um, CentOS 5 and 6, um, an assortment of Mandrivas and an assortment of Ubuntu's. Um, so it's in, I mean, if you look at those, they're sort of the last, it's kind of at least the last two or three versions of everything. Um, are they major versions as well? Are they, it just says like 4, 5, 6, or is it, does it break down further at any stage? Um, okay. No, it's just those, those um, yeah. yeah, just those major versions. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, I noticed when you added the patch, you modified the RPM spec file, but didn't change anything for Debian. Do any of that magic to make that? Okay, the question was I added a patch per patch to a spec file, but I didn't change anything for Debian. Um, and um, I was really hoping nobody would notice that, actually. Um, thank you for proving me wrong. Um, it, means you're paying, it means you're paying attention. Um, no, it doesn't do any magic for that. So I, I actually, I should have gone and um, also added the patch to whatever relevant Debian file would make that apply there. Um, uh, and um, I didn't because... I would have had to read some documentation to find out how to do that. So, um. Okay, so if there is no more question, we will end the session for this morning and we will start again at uh, 1.20 this afternoon uh, with uh, 
packaging for OpenStack with Monty Taylor. Thank you.